This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Get unlimited access, starting at just $2.99 a month. For our audience, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code BRAINFOOD. More on them in a bit. A while ago, we shared the story of F.D.C. Willard, an ordinary house cat who ended up co-authoring a widely cited science paper on low-temperature physics. Today, we're talking about an equally impressive tabby called Larry, who is, believe it or not, an official employee of the UK government. Originally appointed by then-British Prime Minister David Cameron and continuing on with his post through the present Prime Minister Boris Johnson. This is despite Johnson's dog, Jack Russell puppy named Dylan, and Larry's less than enthusiastic response to this new flatmate, with the 12 year old cat tweeting, Confirmation that Downing Street is going to the dogs. It's also noteworthy here that Larry has previously tweeted his aspirations to take the position of Prime Minister himself, caterwauling, I'm announcing that I'm standing to become the next Prime Minister. If Boris Johnson is running, then people deserve a serious candidate too. Hashtag Larry for PM, hashtag Yes We Cat. Losing out on the position of PM, Larry has nonetheless managed to hold on to his post despite the power change. On that note, officially Larry's full title is Chief Mouser to the Cabinet Office of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and his duties mainly involve keeping the famed residence of the Prime Minister, 10 Downing Street, free of pests such as mice and rats. Larry is one of only a handful of cats in British history to officially assume the role of Chief Mouser, though there have been many other cats that have served essentially the same role over the years who did so without the need for a fancy title or any taxpayer money. The role of Mouser supposedly dates back to the reign of King Henry VIII in the 16th century, more specifically his appointing of Thomas Wolsey as Lord Chancellor in 1515. Wolsey was a noted cat lover and is said to have had one at his side pretty much all the time to such an extent that a recently erected statue of him features a small cat. As such, it's believed one of Wolsey's many cats likely served as the first Mouser for the government, official or otherwise. But as for the titled position, the records only go back as far as 1929, when it was noted that the Treasury authorized a set sum of money for the maintenance of an efficient cat. And if you're wondering, it's typical for such a cat to serve at number 10 under multiple prime ministers. For instance, one Peter III served as Chief Mouser from 1946 to 1964 under Prime Ministers Clement Attlee, Winston Churchill, Anthony Eden, Harold Macmillan, and Alec Douglas Holm. Moving back to Larry, when David Cameron assumed office in 2010, 10 Downing Street didn't actually have a chief mouser, as the previous mouser, Sybil, had retired in 2009, supposedly because then-Prime Minister Gordon Brown didn't like her. Initially, David Cameron resisted the idea of hiring a replacement chief mouser, until rats were noticed scurrying around outside of No. 10 Downing Street in several live news reports in early 2011. Though Cameron denied that any plans were in place to appoint chief mouser, internal sources revealed that there was a a strong and ever-present pro-cat faction in 10 Downing Street. Apparently, this mysterious faction were able to sway the Prime Minister because, despite his reservations, he and his family went to Battersea Dogs and Cats Home in February of that year and adopted Larry Cameron, with his tenure as Chief Mouser officially starting on February 15, 2011. And nepotism, it seems, knows no bounds. Needing to come up with a reason one of the Cameron surname would get such a prestigious position over so many other thousands of felines that had worked for years chasing rats and mice at various government offices, this is actually totally a thing, without so much as a good job from Mr. Cameron. According to official statements from the then Prime Minister's team, Larry Cameron was hired because of his time as a former stray, which they claim gave him a high chase drive and hunting instinct. They added that Larry had a very strong predatory drive. Despite Despite high praise of his ninja-like killer instinct, Larry failed to make a kill until two months into his tenure when he killed a small mouse and dropped it at the feet of one of Cameron's secretaries. His work ethic and skill came under further scrutiny when anonymous sources revealed that Larry had been caught sleeping on the job on multiple occasions and even once took a swing at a journalist. A year into his tenure at Downing Street, a press officer urged people to remember that Larry's job doesn't just involve hunting mice and rats, adding that his responsibilities also include greeting guests to the house, inspecting security defenses, and testing antique furniture for napping quality. 
On that note, though he's not a particularly effective chief mouser, it has been noted that Larry is exceptionally talented at greeting and entertaining guests, particularly children who seem to prefer his company to that of the prime ministers that have passed through that office while Larry has reigned silently in the background. That said, Larry has been noted to be slightly averse to men, particularly when he hasn't met them, with the curious exception of former United States President Barack Obama, who Larry warmed up to immediately upon their first encounter. In contrast, Larry didn't even bother to get off his windowsill when President Trump visited, just gazing on from a distance and then tweeting out about his refusal to be bothered shortly thereafter. Larry also once barred Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu from entering No. 10 Downing Street and ultimately had to be shooed away, literally, by a police officer officer so the minister could enter. Larry also attends various benefits and charity events on behalf of the government in an official capacity. In regards to his more specific role of contemplating a solution to the mouse occupancy of the House, the UK's government website features the only known official government quote from Larry, though as alluded to, he does maintain a Twitter account for non-official correspondences. This states that his solution to the problem is in the tactical planning stage. There have been no updates on the status of this plan since, and he's been in the position for almost a decade now. Despite his lackluster work ethic and clearly being appointed to the position just because he'd scratched the backs of those in power, Larry captured the hearts of the people of Britain and has received many letters, treats, and gifts from admirers over the years. However, several years ago, Larry's position as chief mouser was put in jeopardy when a new younger female cat called Freya was brought into number 10 Downing Street. Freya, who was presumed dead at just six months old when she went missing from her home in Notting Hill in 2009, was found alive and well over two years later and returned to her family. This was none other than the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, and his family. They're the occupants of number 11 Downing Street. She immediately began giving Larry a run for his money. Along with being more proficient at killing mice than Larry, no doubt due to being toughened up via her life on the streets for two years, Freya was decidedly more politically inclined, preferring to spend her time in the restricted areas of 10 Downing Street, where secret military missions and other classified matters were discussed. Larry, on the other hand, at the time, mostly was just noted for falling asleep on David Cameron's suits in his personal bedroom. No doubt sleeping with the boss helped Larry keep his cushy government job, despite not actually getting any results. For example, it was noted in one instance that Larry even outright refused to move when David Cameron saw a mouse run across the floor of his study. Cameron attempted to wake Larry up to do his job, but Larry just lay there, uninterested in chasing the rodent. On another occasion, the Prime Minister hurled a piece of cutlery at the mouse during a dinner with his ministers, when Larry was similarly too busy napping to catch it. The mouse escaped unharmed. This led to rumors that the Prime Minister and Larry did not see eye to eye, and perhaps even that Larry was on the take from the rodent parliament of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, who was known to also conduct much of their business at No. 10 Downing Street. As to the former accusation, a spokesman for the Prime Minister denied that there was any rift between Larry and David, releasing an official statement that the pair got on perfectly well. Nevertheless, Freya's results could not be ignored forever, and shortly after her introduction to the household in 2012, reports were issued stating that the two cats would share the job of Chief Mouser. This did not sit well with Larry, and the cats came to blows over the decision later that year, forcing the police to step in and separate them. According to eyewitness accounts, Freya was the clear winner of the fight, no doubt again thanks to her experience living on the streets. Larry once again became the sole Chief Mouser in 2014 when Freya was hit by a car. Although she she survived at the cost of one of her nine lives, her owner decided to send her to the countryside, claiming she wasn't cut out for city life, despite the fact that she'd lived on the streets for over two years at one point, leading some to speculate that the move was perhaps for her own protection. While there's no evidence suggesting foul play on Larry's behalf, those in the know have indicated that it can't be fully ruled out. It should be noted here that Larry has had occasional run-ins with the law, such as in 2015 when a police sniffer dog, Bailey, and Larry got into a heated altercation over matters that were curiously not made public. Maybe it's all a government cover-up. Since then, Larry has caused yet more controversy by failing to protect No. 10 Downing Street from an errant heron and not being around to capture a mouse that was later caught by the aforementioned Chancellor of the Exchequer and former owner of Freya, George Osborne. This led to rumors that Osborne might usurp Larry's position, as his pet had once done. No doubt, out of fear of having his own little automobile accident, Osborne has never pursued the position, despite his obvious skill. Curiously, despite the run-ins with the law, obvious government cover-ups, now three different prime ministers passing through during his tenure and a complete lack of results, 
Larry's position, which comes with no salary but still somehow finds him able to afford his life in the lap of luxury, continues to remain. Speaking of the lap of luxury, were you aware that at one point in time Howard Hughes bought an entire TV station just so he could call them up at any time and tell them what to play so he could watch what he wanted whenever he wanted? Well, thanks to CuriosityStream, today's sponsor, you don't have to buy a TV station to achieve the same thing. You just need $2.99 a month and you'll get access to 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. So yes, for less than the price of a cup of coffee a month, you can have something better than what a billionaire had just a few decades ago. And you can also watch it on your phone, something Hughes couldn't even possibly have understood. So you can get unlimited access for just $2.99 a month, and for our audience, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code brainfood, all one word lowercase during the sign up process. What I love about CuriosityStream is that you can just go to the platform, you can pick something from the homepage, and I, the reality is you've probably just found some documentary series that you've never heard of. Like I went on there the other day, I wanted to watch something, and I clicked on pretty much just randomly a show called Redesign My Brain. It's a documentary from 2013 out of Australia. I've never heard of it. There's some dude who basically tries to train himself to be smarter and more creative with science. It's a really good show. It's one of those ones you're like, how did I not know about this? And this is basically what happens on Curiosity Stream when you get it. You can find out about that in those 30 days for free. So go to curiositystream.com forward slash brain food, get those 30 days for free, and then it starts at just $2.99 a month. So yeah, it's pretty great. There's also a link below. And let's get into a bonus fact. Speaking of a cat running for Prime Minister, while Larry may have missed his opportunity for power, a dog named Bosco Ramasa, Black Lab Rottweiler mix, was genuinely elected mayor of an unincorporated, census-designated place in California called Sunnel in 1981, serving in the role for 13 years until he died. How he got into the job in the first place was simply that his owner thought the whole thing would be funny. So entered him in the race under the platform Dogs of People 2, and with campaign promises including a bone in every dish, a cat in every tree, and a fire hydrant on every corner. Bosco was not only elected, but even ran against two human beings, both of whom he beat in a landslide. The same can be said of Duke, a dog who became the honorary mayor of a small town in Minnesota, winning by nine votes in his election. It should be noted here that the town only had 12 residents, meaning that I guess he technically won by a landslide. Funny enough, the individual who ran against Duke won Richard Sherbrooke, even claims he voted for the dog rather than himself. Again, Duke's position was ceremonial, but the residents of the town were happy to have him as mayor, with Sherbrooke describing the idea of having the dog mayor as pretty cool. However, just because nobody expects a canine mayor to do anything, it doesn't mean their terms in office aren't gleefully noted by the local populace as if the animal did function as an actual official mayor. Going back to Bosco for a moment, while he was in office, the doggy mayor would regularly meet with the citizens of the town taking daily strolls about the town to meet with his constituents. While serving as mayor, Bosco became something of a celebrity, appearing on TV, earning $2,000 for his owner in one such appearance, and at one point caused an international incident when Chinese newspapers widely reported on his election as an example of the shortcomings of democracy and why it should be avoided. Bosco literally took all of this in his stride, and when the Tiananmen Square incident happened in 1989, he was invited to join protests organized by students at Berkeley and Stanford in front of the Chinese embassy as an honored guest. His owner accepted the offer. Bosco also led the Halloween parade every year and attended formal events wearing a doggy tuxedo. When he wasn't being formal, Bosco was recognizable due to his habit of wearing a red bandana. It wasn't all smooth sailing for Bosco, though, and his tenure wasn't without controversy, one of the most infamous being his liaisons with numerous female dogs while on the clock, resulting in numerous illegitimate pups being sired. In addition, Bosco also went missing for a week in 1987, turning up a week later with a stick in his mouth. He's never revealed where he went, so it's assumed he was enjoying a raunchy rendezvous with a female dog. Bosco also frequently got caught being bribed with ice cream and would act aggressively when people withheld his favorite treat, beef jerky. After his death in 1994, the people of Sunol paid tribute to Bosco by erecting a bronze bust of the world's first canine mayor. Despite his well-known love of formal clothing, the artist responsible for Bosco's statue chose to depict him in everyday attire. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that like button below and do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. And please do check out our great sponsor, Curiosity Stream, 30 days for free. Link below. And thank you for watching.